Okay, this is a lecture that I originally gave in, I believe it was 2007. So it's a long, long, long time ago at this point. Uh, it was about seven years before I started Handmade Hero. Uh, and I guess it's 10 years to today, maybe a little, little over 10 years. So it's, I think it's, I think this talk is actually a decade old. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I believe it is. And the circumstances around which I gave this talk was that I had gone back to Boston, Massachusetts, which is, it's, I didn't grow up in Boston, but I grew up in Massachusetts. I had gone back there and uh, I had gone for reasons I don't totally remember to a local sort of uh, game developer group that they were having there. And I had met a, a fellow there uh, whose name was uh, Philip Tan. I, I don't actually know exactly how to pronounce his last name because I don't think I've ever actually heard it pronounced. Uh, but he, uh, it might be Tan, it might be Tan. He uh, ran a group at MIT called uh, Gambit. It was G-A-M-B-I-T. And it was a group that was specifically sort of partnered with uh, the Singaporean government. And I don't know the circumstances under which they ran this exactly, but it had something to do with the fact that Singapore uh, wanted to encourage game development to occur in their country more so than it was already. And I do think at that time there was also things they were doing to try, like a favorable tax status or things like this, to try to encourage game companies to set up shop there, uh, probably because they perceived other countries to be starting to have good game development industries and they maybe didn't have that and thought that there was stuff that they could do. I, I remember actually South Korea doing something similar uh, around that, uh, a little earlier actually, but very, 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 very similar. So there are a couple countries that were doing this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> those are the two that I'm aware of, but I think it was kind of a common thing around the world as game development started to become a little more popular. And so what the Singaporean government had done in this particular case is they had uh, w one of uh, their sort of uh, initiatives was to work with MIT uh, to create something which was effectively a program for students who uh, I don't really know how those students were selected back in Singapore, but I assume that it was based on, you know, aptitude for computer programming or art or other sorts of things that were, uh, you know, game development related. These students would go over and spend time at MIT during the summer uh, working with uh, various game development technologies and being sort of taught how to make games by people uh, who were set up at this, in, in, as part of this program. That's about really all I know about it, but I believe it still exists to this day. I could be wrong about that, but it, it was still going for quite some time after I gave this lecture. Anyway, I met the fellow who was uh, in charge of running that, that operation and he asked if I would come and give a talk to the students there. And there's only, you know, a handful of students there. It's 15, 30, something like this. So this was the talk that I prepared for that occasion. And it's only ever been seen by those 30 people or however many people were in the room that day, the, just the people for that program. But it was one of my favorite lectures uh, that I've ever done because it was very personal uh, and about a topic that I actually cared about unlike most lectures that I give, which really aren't. Uh, they're usually on a technical topic that's not really, that's just kind of abstract. And so this topic was very personal. And in fact, it was basically the, the mindset that led to Handmade Hero was encapsulated in this talk back in 2007. And the talk was specifically, uh, you could say, talking about the same, all the same things that I tried to get across with Handmade Hero are in this talk already. Uh, and this is sort of where I was already thinking about this and having this opinion kind of at that time. And it just wasn't till seven or eight years later that I actually started Handmade Hero, but it's the same basic idea. So that's the, uh, that, that's the context for the talk, if you will. Uh, and it's called How to Open a Black Box. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the run through of the talk now. Uh, as close as I can do it to how I did it back then, but it's been 10 years, so the chances that I'll remember exactly how it goes are pretty low, but I'll do my best. <clears throat> All right, so in the industry, we have a term called black box, and you've probably heard it if you've ever been in programming circles. Essentially, what it means is 
it, it really is a little bit wrong because black box, you know, maybe is different from orange box, is different from purple box. It sounds like you're talking about the color of the box's exterior, like how is it painted? Uh, but that's not what we mean when we say black box. What we really mean is opaque box. We mean a box you cannot see into. Um, so the opposite of a black box would be something that was transparent box. So it's really opaque box uh, versus transparent box is the important part. And the key to it is that you're talking about, when you use the term black box, something that you don't really know how it works, right? Uh, and there's two reasons you might not know how it works. One reason is that you simply can't. So for example, a closed source piece of software that uh, is too complex to really be reverse engineered by you in a reasonable amount of time, you might say this is a black box because there's just no way for you to know what it's actually doing. Another reason you might have a black box is that you simply haven't taken the time to understand the system yet, but you certainly could, right? And those are the two uh, times you might be talking about something as a black box. In one case, something really truly is completely opaque to you, and you will never be able to really know what's going on inside specifically because you simply don't have access. On the other hand, uh, you can have a situation where something easily could be understood by you and you could investigate it further, but you're choosing not to do so. So let's talk about what a black box might be like in the case of a video game today. Uh, so something that I don't think I mentioned at the time because it really wasn't necessarily something uh, that would have been in widespread use, but something like a game engine like Unity or Unreal, you might think of as a black box because you maybe don't really know much about how it works, but you're going to use it. Or maybe you're using some kind of a game development library. So something like a load texture call, uh, you may understand conceptually what a load texture call does, in the engine, you know that it loads a texture off of disk and maybe brings that texture into memory. Uh, and all you really know about this black box is that when you make this load texture call, you are going to get back this texture that you stored on the disk. It's going to come into memory and you can start using it to texture surfaces. The reason we might say this is a black box, again, is because you don't really know how that happened. You don't know how the texture was really stored. You don't know how it might have been compressed or decompressed. You don't know if it was transcoded on the fly. You don't know whether it was loaded on demand or delay loaded or whatever happened. You don't really know much about the implementation. You just know semantically, I said load texture, I got a texture. The same would be true for the play sound call. Maybe you hear sound out the speakers. You don't really know much about how that happened. Maybe there's a physics call like apply force. You don't really know how the physics engine works, but you know that when you apply force, the like bouncing ball starts bouncing around or whatever, right? And these are examples of game code on the left side, all of those things that I said, and uh, the game on the right side. And that's how you would conceptualize these things if you have a black box as an engine in between. You think of the left side, the play sound, the load texture, as the code for the game, and you think of the things that happen, the results you saw as the game, and there's a black box sitting in the middle. What is that black box? Well, it's the game engine, and you have no idea how it works, right? It's completely opaque to you. You just know semantically you do something and something else happens on the other end. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's the second kind of black box in most circumstances. Now, it certainly depends on the particular engine you're talking about. There are closed source engines out there, but say, take, for example, the Unreal Engine. My understanding today is that unless there's a particularly unusual circumstance, when you are using the Unreal Engine, you actually have the source code to the engine as well. So if you didn't know how it worked, it's not because you couldn't investigate, it's because you simply haven't investigated. On the other hand, there are circumstances where you don't get access to engines source code, so you may be using an engine in other cases where you literally have no way of knowing how it works, the semantics are all you will ever get. But in either case, it, it, as long as those two things were true, uh, one of those two things were true, you would have one of these opaque boxes you did not understand. Okay? So, <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about today is why it might be important for you to understand what happens inside that black box. Uh, and who the types of people are who probably should learn what happens inside that black box. And finally, give a motivating example to show what exactly the results are uh, and why it, uh, it proves to be very useful to have a complete understanding of how game engine code works if you're uh, sort of in this category of people who probably should care, right? Because I don't argue that everyone should care I only argue that certain people should care. 
So the topic that I want to talk about that motivates these things is normal mapping. And normal mapping is hopefully something that most people are familiar with today uh, in the black box sense, so in the semantic sense. It's something that even an artist, someone who doesn't do programming, probably understands at least semantically now because it's part of the job. So even though a normal map is a very technical topic at some level, it has become so commonplace in game development that even people who don't program must know what it is and must know how to make one, even if they don't necessarily understand mathematically uh, what it is. Now, a normal map, for those of you who may not quite know what one is, uh, it's a very simple concept. The idea is that when you have a three-dimensional object that you have created, uh, it is necessarily built out of pieces that may not encode all of the information necessary to say the, the sort of fairing of the surface, the, the textural aspects of the surface that run along the surface that relate to how bumpy it is uh, or sort of how it reflects light, if you will. Right? So there's a lot of information that we need to encode when we talk about modeling a 3D object. And so we end up with a series of maps that sit on that surface and then encode this information. Information like how reflective, how shiny something is. Information like what the reflected color is. So what colors does it absorb? What colors does it reflect? And finally, information like how is this dis displaced or how it uh, has like little fine uh, le levels of bumps or uh, sort of uh, defects in the surface that will cause the light to catch in those areas. And that last part is typically encoded these days with a normal map. A normal map is something that says, I'm going to pretend that I know more about this surface than the information I actually have in the three-dimensional model. I'm going to pretend that I know lots of little microscopic, well, probably not microscopic, uh, still macroscopic, but very tiny little surface changes, little bumps, little, little uh, pieces of information there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a two-dimensional texture like I would use for other things. And instead of encoding things like color in it, I'm gonna encode those little fine little bumps. So that way when I have something like a uh, skin or something and I wanna have every little pore uh, of the skin represented there, I don't actually have to have a three dimensional model that has every pore in it actually running at runtime. Instead, I can just have a map that captures those pores and I can put that on the surface as a map and re-get that uh, fine geometry there, okay? So that's what a normal uh, map is. Now, why do I want to talk about uh, this topic? Well, <clears throat> the reason I want to talk about this topic is because if you go back uh, to sort of the, the turn of the millennium, if you will, uh, we didn't know anything about normal mapping really in the game industry. It was a pretty new concept. And although we sort of knew about bump mapping, because bump mapping is a topic that's much older, and I'll kind of try to explain the difference between those two things a little bit uh, for those who don't know. But although bump mapping was kind of well understood because uh, I believe it was Jim Blinn who originally introduced it, introduced it, you know, in, I don't know, the early 80s, late 70s, something like this. It, bump mapping had been around a long time. And what bump mapping was, is it was sort of a similar concept to normal mapping, and it was much earlier. And what you encoded in the texture map was just height. It's like a height field. It's like mapping a height field onto your object. And what uh, the renderer would do that you would be using in this case uh, is you would take the information in the bump map, those heights, and at render time, you would do a sort of differential to figure out how the normal should bend based on the height map. Now this is a reasonably good technique and it had a lot of nice applications back in the day, but it's got drawbacks. And specifically, since it's based on a difference, there's only so much bend you can encode because since you're not encoding directly the way the surface is pointing, like you can with a normal map, because a normal map actually encodes a normal, it encodes the direction the surface is pointing. A bump map can only get you so far. Now to give you an analogy of why this is true, imagine a height map right? Probably you've played with a height map before if you've ever done anything with game development. A height map just says at every point in the world, how high is it? Well, if you want to make a perfectly sheer cliff, you can't do it with a height map because it has two points that it's going to interpolate between, right? And it knows this one's this high and this one's this low. It doesn't know it should be perfectly flat, so it makes it still a little bit slanted. The same thing is true of a bump map. It only has those two points to deal with. It doesn't know that there's supposed to be a perfectly flat peak there. It thinks that it just should connect them with a line, just like it would everything else. 
it's exactly the same thing as a height map. You can't encode it perfectly. Normal maps, therefore, are much better because what they encode is the actual normal. If you want something to point directly to the side, you just encode at this point, it points directly to the side. And so it gives you a lot more flexibility there to encode what's actually happening with the surface. You don't need any more information. You don't need to, to try to guess what's supposed to happen because it knows at this point, the normal should be exactly this. So it's a way of storing more directly what's going on. And these sorts of things were starting to slowly get introduced around this time into game development because there had been research papers on the topic and so on and so forth, right? Now, what I've uh, got on the screen right now is an example of why normal mapping is so interesting. So if you take a look at these two uh, meshes, they're half of a face. If you take a look at what, uh, what you're seeing there, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know how oftentimes we only model one half the face and then we mirror it. This is one half of a face. Uh, and you can see a little white line that shows the, the light direction that's coming in. And what hopefully you can see here is that although the left and right sides are completely different numbers of triangles. So for example, on the left side, there's 31,000 triangles in that mesh. And on the right side, there's only 894, right? A massive difference in the number of triangles. The two meshes, when rendered, look almost identical except for their profile edges. And what I mean by that is if you look at something like an actual geometric feature, the eyebrow, the nose, the ear, along the profile you can see how rough the 894 tri uh, ver triangle version is. It's very rough, right? But on the other hand, if you look at the interior, it's still just right. It's perfectly smooth everywhere in here. It doesn't look rough at all. And that's what was so powerful about normal mapping is it allowed you to encode these really nice clean normals into your mesh that made it look like a really high res model, even though you were rendering almost no triangles. And this was really powerful. So the only problem at this point became how do you clean up the silhouettes? And even if you didn't clean up the silhouettes, it still just looks great. And what you can see if I move the light around is as I move that light around, uh, you can really see that it responds just like it should. And again, the only errors you see are really along those silhouette edges. They just are, they're just too rough. But all of that lighting is captured beautifully by the normal map, right? So that's really why this was so important, right? Is we can get so much fidelity into a very low resolution model uh, by leveraging this technique. Now, what I want to try and il uh, illustrate here is that normal mapping is a good example of something that it didn't even exist, right? Um, this, I believe, uh, as of 2007, um, which was when the lecture was given, normal mapping was completely ubiquitous, more or less at this point, right? So when I gave this lecture, and also obviously today, which is even later, normal mapping is not something you probably think about at a low level. It's something that you just take for granted and you treat it semantically just like the black box game engine code that I was talking about back in the beginning of the lecture. But, if you imagine it back in 2002, uh, nobody knew how to do anything with it. It was completely new. It wasn't even in game engines yet. Nobody had any idea how to do anything with it. We didn't know how to make them. We didn't know how to efficiently encode them. We didn't know how uh, to even get the artists to, to work with them, right? And so what I want to kind of illustrate is that if by taking something that now we do take for granted as being in the game engine, if we go back in time, right, every single thing we take for granted now at some point in time was a new frontier. And people needed to push on that frontier in order to get it to the point where we could use it as if it was a black box and maybe not care as much, right? All right. So here's what the challenge looked like back at the turn of the millennium. Uh, acquisition of normal maps, where do they come from, right? Projection of normal maps, how do we get them onto the models that we need? Sampling of them, so how do we take the projected version of them and figure out what goes on what, right? There's encoding of them, how do we store them and how do we use them at runtime? There's post-processing, how do they get cleaned up? 
And this is all at the head end. This is when we're making stuff, right? And then we've got the back end part of the process. How do we decode them at runtime? How do we shade them? Uh, you know, how do we write shaders that use them? So in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about this part. And the reason I'm going to be talking about this part is because it's the basic foundational part. The rest of it is actually very interesting as well. And in fact, one of the things that I worked on uh, that I was particularly proud of in this time is we had uh, in our code, I think arguably the very fastest by several orders of magnitude, normal mapping capture system uh, that people had made. And so that first part was really exciting too. But in order to get to that part, you have to understand the basic parts first. So we're going to focus on that in this lecture. Maybe I can do another lecture later that talks about the other part of it, because that part was pretty exciting as well. OK, so here we go. <clears throat> Let's start by doing a, a little bit of mathematical warm up, because one of the things that certainly and I can this was not part of the lecture when I originally gave it because I didn't do handmade here at the time. It was seven years before I started it or eight years. I'm not sure how many. Um, but one of the things that I get asked all the time, all the time. I get emails from tons of people who ask this. I get asked it on stream all the time. It's how important is math for game development? Uh, and my answer is usually got to be a little bit equivocal. Uh, the answer is not at all or it's crucial and you must know it. And the, the difference depends on what kind of game programming you're doing. Uh, it always, always, always matters um, what kind you're doing. If you are dealing with physics or graphics or any of these things, math is fundamental and you must know it. You must know it very, very well and you can't be scared of it. Uh, and so suffice to say, when we're talking about something that's really graphics specific, and in this case, we're talking about pushing a frontier, uh, math is absolutely crucial and you must know it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run through some mathematics. Maybe those of you out there who are sort of new to game development aren't going to get what I'm talking about, and that is okay. I'm trying to give you a little bit of the flavor of the way that we think about these things and some of the basic math that's required of you uh, when you do get there. So don't let this scare you off, the fact that this math may be a little bit difficult for you to grasp. I'm not expecting you to get it all. I'm expecting you to go, oh, I see. This is why we say mathematics is important for game development. And this is why we say it's involved in what you're doing. So what I've written here is an equation. It's a very, very simple equation to a game developer who's used to working with math, but it may be completely foreign and bizarre to somebody who has only had high school math, hasn't had linear algebra, and so on. What it represents is a spatial transform. It represents taking some point in some space and moving it or rotating it, scaling it, doing something like this. And we would all recognize this very quickly. P is the standard notation for a point, a point in three-dimensional space, for example, like the kind we would care about in game development. P prime, which is on the left side, our standard notation for something that happened to p afterward, right? So p prime is, is the new point that we're getting, right? It's a point that has moved or transformed or scaled in some way, and p was the input. So think the right-hand side, that just p by itself, that's the input, p prime, that's the output. And this big r, that r represents a matrix. It represents a matrix that will move our point, rotate our point, scale our point. So p prime equals rp is a way of stating something very simple. A new point, p prime, comes from equals a transform r operating on an input point, p. p prime equals rp. Now, here's what it looks like expanded out. On the left, you see p prime. It is a vector because this is three-dimensional. If it was one-dimensional, it would only be one value, x. But because it's three-dimensional, it has three values, x, y, and z. You can notice each of them has a prime because they are new values that I'm talking about here that are changes to p. So I have cons I've sort of worked that into the notation where the x, y, and z are also the primes. They're the new values of x, y, and z I'm talking about. In the middle, I've got the same old equal sign. Again, mirrors this equation exactly. 
Then I've got my transform, R. It's a bag of numbers. I have no idea what these numbers mean yet. I'm not even going to talk about what they mean. I just know they're a big old matrix of numbers, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Okay, and that's intentional. Now, I am someone who's worked with graphics way too long. So I have meanings and I have preconceived notions and all sorts of things that I apply when I see a three-dimensional matrix. But right now, we're not talking about those. We're going to pretend we just don't even, we're not even thinking about these like that yet. We just know there's a big bag of numbers in there. And then finally, we have P on the other side. That's our input. Again, three dimensions because the three-dimensional point X, Y, and Z. It tells us where in space this point is. Okay, this is the simplest possible transform equation. It doesn't even involve movement. It only involves scale, rotate, shear. That's really what this is going to involve. Why? Because the matrix is three dimensional for a three dimensional input. And in order to uh, encompass things like uh, translation or projection, things like this, we would have to have a four by four matrix. That's a topic for another day. You don't have to concern yourself with this. Just suffice to say, all we can do with these equations mathematically is all we can do is rotate, scale, shear, those sorts of transforms, okay? All right. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to mention now, and again, it's okay if this is a little bit too much for people who haven't come to the math right now, is to think about what does this bag of numbers mean? Because if you see something like this and you've never had linear algebra before, you're going to be very confused, right? You're going to be like, I don't know what's going on here. I have no idea what's happening here, right? Um, but once you start to learn more about how matrix multiplication works, how a matrix multiplies a vector, in this case, on this side of the um, equation here, we have a matrix times a vector. Uh, what you will learn is that matrix multiplication is a very rote process. You can learn how to do it. It's very simple. We actually take A times X, B uh, times Y, C times Z, and we add them together. Then we do X times D, E times Y, right? There's a rote process you use. Again, don't need to worry about it now. It's not the focus of this lecture at all. People who don't get it, it's okay. Someday you will if you work on uh, this kind of programming for a living. But for those of you who get it, you know how to do matrix multiplication. You've probably seen it before. You've definitely had it if you've gone to learning algebra class in college. If you've ever worked on the 3D graphics textbook, they've gone through this. So it's something that's pretty common in 3D graphics. However, and here's the part that I kind of want to get to in this lecture. Even if you've had the basics of linear algebra, the basics of 3D graphics programming, a lot of people, for whatever reason, don't really understand how a matrix really works internally. And some people don't know how to interpret the numbers in a matrix. They just think of them as something that does a particular transform. And they read in a book somehow, somewhere how to make one of these matrices so they know how to make, say, a rotation matrix by using a formula that they've looked up in a book. And they know that if they multiply the matrices in this format, like I said before, that they get a particular operation that occurs. Okay, And that's all they know. So what I want to focus on here is a little bit deeper understanding. Let's say you do know how to do that matrix multiplication, but you don't really understand why or how it's working. So let's take a look at this diagram here. Here is a set of points defined like uh, the P value that I was talking about in the previous equation. So imagine any one of these points is just the P value. So we're going to take every point in the object and we'll do this transform on every single one of them to get a new object, right? Now it goes, a lot of times people are used to thinking left to right, so because uh, that's the way you read. But in math, oftentimes we go right to left more often because we're solving equations. So we want the thing on the left side to be the one variable we've solved for, right? So that's why it looks like this. So we're really reading it right to left, okay? The input's on this side and the output's on this side. The arrow goes that way. That's just how it works in mathematics when you solve typically by convention. So the new point we're getting here is a rotated object, as you can see here, right? And the input is this object. Now, each of the axes I've highlighted here, I've highlighted the x-axis in red, the green is the y-axis, and the z is the blue axis. And what you can see over here is we take this input, and it's around the world axis system. It's just the basic axis system. They're aligned. When I apply this transform, now I have transformed the object. You can see that it has rotated itself away from those world axes, OK? And what I've written here is I've written r sub w. This is just uh, it's free for me in mathematics to put a little subscript on something and say, I'm just going to denote this rotation matrix with R uh, as a world rotation matrix, W, 
And I'm using that notation to say this is something that places an object into the world, okay? So it takes an object that's at rest and it puts it at some orientation in the world. You can see that happening by the diagrams. P prime is the new object that's been placed in the world. So now I ask the question, how does that bag of numbers in a matrix, which maybe you've seen before but haven't thought too much about, and those of you who've already watched the Handmade Hero series should know the answer because we've gone over this, but maybe you haven't. What do those numbers mean? Well, what I'd like to emphasize here is that actually there's a very specific structure to something like a matrix that rotates an object to place it into the world. And in fact, you can look directly at the numbers of that matrix and pull out specifically what the axes of the new object will be because they're read straight off the columns. The columns of a matrix are actually the new axes of the object after it's been rotated. Believe it or not, some people go through their whole programming career not even knowing that. They just learned that this is how you make a rotation matrix out of some book. They never really thought too much about it. And in fact, this was an interview que question. I don't mean to spoiler it. Uh, I won't even say where the interview question, uh, who actually gave it, but let's just say a Valve interview question actually involved asking the candidate these questions. And you would be surprised at how many people can't give a very good answer because it's common to learn to use something without really knowing how it works even in graphics programming. Okay, why? Why does that happen, right? I basically just told you that if I look at a 3D rotation matrix, the three axes, right, of the X, Y, and Z world coordinates, I've just said that's what happened, like, I just said that, but why does it happen that way, right? Why is it that these three axes appear in this matrix in this fashion? Why is it that that's what that equation does, right? Uh, well, the answer is because I can look at matrix multiplication as producing a very specific result here, okay? So what I've done, again, for the benefit of those of you who maybe haven't done enough with matrices yet, I've written out how the matrix multiplication works. I alluded to it before. I take A, B, and C of the matrix here, and I multiply it by X, Y, and Z of the input point, and I add them together. You can see it right here, AX plus BY plus CZ. That's how I get my first row of my resulting point. Next row, same thing, but I move down one. I use the next row of the matrix, but the same input point. Finally, last row of the matrix, same input point. And you can see very easily here how the math works out. Anyone who's gone to even a pre-algebra class can understand this side here. So again, it's very easy to understand these things. It looks intimidating when it's presented like this or like this because you aren't familiar with it perhaps. But once I write it out, it's very simple, right? These are very simple things that don't involve anything. There isn't even a squared term or a square root or imaginary numbers. None of these things are involved, right? Very, very simple. So let's concentrate on that left side because everyone can understand that left side. And what you'll notice here is that if I look, there's a very specific structure. A, D, and G, the column of this matrix, always multiplies X. B, E, and H always multiplies Y. C, F, and I, right, always multiply Z. If you imagine pulling those out, you can start to see exactly how this operation works. I'm not really doing a matrix multiplication. I mean, I am, but I don't have to think of it that way. Instead, I could think of it as the input X coordinate multiplied by a new vector. The input Y coordinate multiplied by a new vector. The Z coordinate multiplied by a new vector. What's this doing? It's just moving me out along these three axes, right? That's all I'm doing. You can see it very clearly here if I reduce the notation to just talk about axes. Here's my X axis in world space, Y axis in world space, Z axis in world space. The X input multiplies the X axis, the Y input, the Y axis, the Z input, the Z axis. That's why these are the new axes. It's all very simple if you go look at the scalars, right? Very, very straightforward.
So you can understand very easily how these things are working. You don't even need to think of it in terms of matrices. You can just think of it as multiplying each vector by how far along I want to go. And that's it. So here's a diagram if, in case this is not uh, easy for you to mentally conceptualize what's happening geometrically, right? If I have an X vector in world space, right? Like I said, I did. I want to go X distance along it. That's what my X coordinate will mean in the new coordinate system, right? Same thing with Y along the Y axis. Same thing with Z along the Z axis. So effectively, I'm building my new vector, right? I'm building my new vector out this way. I'm building that by just stepping along each of the new axes. And that's why I can look at this matrix and say these are the new axes of the object. All right. Let's do it one more time. Here's the matrix. It's the exact same matrix. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, right? Same pack of numbers even. If I want to, it could be the exact same matrix equivalent. But this time, we're going to look at it differently. We're going to look at it as doing something different. Okay, another way to conceptualize it. Let's suppose that I wanted to say this was a camera transform, right? So I'm handing you a matrix and I'm saying I'm going to use this as the transform that maps the world into a particular camera's space so that I can render it. Again, still a three-dimensional matrix. I'm just going to use it for a different purpose. How can we interpret what it does? Now, I know this is a foreign concept, but remember, a three by three matrix can be used for all sorts of purposes. So how I choose to use it will determine the questions I might want to ask and how I get those answers. If I'm using my three-dimensional matrix to place an object in the world, then the numbers in the matrix are interpreted a specific way, not because the multiplication is done differently, but because how I use the results determines which numbers are important and why, right? In terms of my understanding. The three-dimensional math will always be the same, but the results that I produce are always based on what I use those results for. And so how I want to think about the numbers of the matrix will change based on what that matrix is doing. And this should be obvious to anyone who thinks about it because matrices are used for everything. So obviously, I can't always think about a bag of numbers the same way because that bag of numbers is going to be used in many, many different contexts. So I must learn to think about the numbers in that matrix based on its use. So same kind of matrix, three by three, still a rotation, no changes in my requirements for the matrix, but now I'm using it for something different. I'm using it as a transform that will transform the world into a particular orientation for rendering. How do I interpret the values? Well, we have to start by saying the operation is now reversed. I'm starting with an object on the right-hand side that is somewhere in the world for real. And what I want to do is I want to move it into a space where it's aligned with a new set of axes. So let's suppose we're talking about the object that is the camera. This is the object I want to view the world from. Well, obviously what I know about this then is that the camera transform must set that object aligned with the world axes. Because once I render, everything must be aligned with the world axis because I'm going to render down the world axis system, right? So the act of rendering a camera transform must move the world into uh, a specific space that is the camera space so that the world axes and the camera axes are now aligned. At the start, they won't be aligned, and afterward they will be. Again, right to left reading because we've solved for the left hand side. All right, what do these numbers mean? Well, it might be confusing and surprising at first, but actually the opposite thing is true of a camera transform as an object transform. A camera transform is read by its rows. Each row gives the axis in world space of the camera that will become the aligned camera after the transform is over. So as you can see, we've got a red axis for the X, 
a yellow, I'm sorry, a green axis for the Y and a blue axis for the Z. And here you can see where they are placed in the matrix. Just by looking at the matrices numbers, you know those axes straight off. If you know this is a camera transform, those are the axes. Why? Why is this the case? Why is it that the X axis of the camera goes in the, row, in the top row, the Y axis of the camera goes in the middle row, and the Z axis of the camera goes in the bottom row? <clears throat> Again, it's the exact same equation as with the world space one. How is it that the meaning can be looked at in these two totally different ways just based on whether I was using it for one thing or using it for another thing, right? Well, the answer gets back to the exact same scalar equation. And again, it's because matrix math only does one thing. So if I use it for one purpose, I have to analyze it one way. And if I use it for another purpose, I have to analyze it another way. But the scalar math can't change. It's still a matrix multiply, and it still has to produce the exact same results because the underlying computation doesn't change just because I mentally wanted to use a matrix for something different. So let's take a look at these scalars over here. How can I get an axis out of A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, H, I, and why would they mean the camera transform? I don't understand. Let's do the same thing we did before. Before we observed that we could produce structure out of this unstructured set of scalar equations, and they're not really equations, they're computations really, because we're talking about just this side, there's no equal sign anymore. <clears throat> out of these scalar expressions, how can I produce that structure? Well, this time what I'd like to do is think of it as a dot product instead, right? A dot product is the thing we were actually doing to do the matrix math, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, A, X plus B, Y plus C, Z. The dot product is exactly that operation. Now, if you've never heard of a dot product before, I'm sorry to throw the term at you, but again, the math, incredibly simple. If I have one vector, x, y, z, and another vector, a, b, c, I am literally just talking about multiplying the x's, y's, and z's of each and adding them together. That's it. Again, so simple, it's pre-algebra. You don't even have to solve an equation, nothing involved. It's just multiplication and addition. That's it. That's a dot product. Well, if you take a look here, you can see that those dot products are in each row. Every row is a dot product. So let's take a look. <clears throat> if we were to isolate our dot products, what do we get? These are the three dot products we get. abc.xyz, def.xyz, and ghi.xyz, right? Those are the dot products I get, which means effectively what I have done is I've taken each row of the camera transform and dotted it with the input point. That produces exactly the operation we want for a camera. The input point measured along the x uh, axis of the, the x row, first row of the matrix. The input point measured along the y row. The input point measured along the z row. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the dot product, you may be like, well, okay, I don't understand what you mean by that. What do you even mean by measured by? Or why do I care that I'm taking three dot products? I believe you because I can see that these are three of the things that you said. It's three of these things, right? But why does that produce a camera transform? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to get a little bit deeper into the mathematics. But let's go ahead and do that. I just said a dot product is this equation, right? If I have two vectors, the x, the y, and the z get multiplied and added together. And we notate it this way, A transpose B. Now, why do we notate it A transpose B? What does that mean? Well, transpose in linear algebra means to flip something around its diagonal, okay? And you can actually see that here. This and this are both three-dimensional vectors, but one has been flipped. It's been laid on its side. Right? So you can think of this as A transpose B because this is how we normally write a vector vertically, X, Y, Z, right? And I don't want to get too bogged down in linear algebra, but there are actually reasons why we write a three-dimensional point um, or a three-dimensional vector uh, lined up like that. And there's some minutia there if you wanted to get into it. It's not relevant to our current uh, conversation, but let's just say there's a reason, uh, if you go deeper into the math, why some are vertical and some are horizontal. But 
if we were to take vectors that we all would be considering vertical and we lay one down on its side, that's a transpose operation. We're taking it and the rows become columns and the columns become rows. Since there's only one column, it becomes a row when we transpose it. So we say A transpose B for a dot product, we say that because we're lying this one down on its side and this one is still vertical. So you can see this operation drawn out for you here. It's very simple. Hopefully it makes good sense. When I take a vector A and I transpose it, I'm laying it down its side. Columns become rows, rows become columns. And you can do this with a matrix too. Anything that is a two dimensional grid of numbers like this, you can do it too, right? And by the way, there's multi-dimensional versions of this, but again, we don't care about that for our purposes. We're totally fine with just these. So here we see A transpose B written out. You can see that A gets transposed, the B does not. They multiply together just in that very straightforward way that all of matrix multiplication was working as even if you didn't know it, you've seen me do it a couple times already right now. And we produce as a result, the dot product, the result that is the dot product. And it's one scalar, it's a single value. Each of these multiply together and give us a single value, like five, right? These were, uh, more compound values. They had three values in them. Five, seven, nine, three, two, one, whatever. But this result here, it's one value. So it, the dot product by its nature is contractual, right? It brings things together and reduces their dimension. Okay. So <clears throat> how does this produce a camera transform? It was very easy to see in that walking out along the axis form how multiplying vectors by scalars produced the world space transform. Hopefully that made sense to everybody. But the dot product is a little harder to grok. Why would that produce a camera transform? Why does that produce the basis? Well, the reason is because the dot product actually produces a very special version of <clears throat> the law of cosines. And I will walk you through what that is because it's a little hard to understand. Here is a dot b at the top. Hopefully everyone understands that this is what we mean by that. And again, that's just the notation we use. We write it like that to represent this scalar multiplication and addition, okay? We write it like this if we're gonna be a little fancier because uh, that's the more matrix-like notation. This is the more informal notation. But what both of these actually compute, and I'll show you how they do it. What both of these actually compute is the length of the input vector a the length of the input vector B multiplied together times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Believe it or not, that's what they produce. So this single scalar value produced by this scalar equation actually has all of this meaning, length of A times length of B times cosine theta, all of that meaning is wrapped up right in that one operation. How? How is it possible? I, what? Right? Well, it turns out that you can actually see this pretty easily. Uh, if you actually just look at how the equation uh, breaks down, right? It's actually not that difficult to see uh, how it works, right? Uh, and so what we can do here is we can see uh, that if we were to take the law of cosines, which is this equation up here. And again, I apologize for not proving the law of cosines to you, uh, but unfortunately that would be a whole different ball game, right? Uh, proving the law of cosines or where that comes from, we start to get deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole of math. But anyone who's had high school geometry, or trigonometry, sorry, uh, will have seen the law of cosines already. I've written it for you at the top. It's A minus B, so we take two vectors, we subtract them. We take the length of A minus B squared, and we know that the law of cosines says that that equals, right, the length of A squared plus the length of B squared minus two times the length of A, length of B times the cosine of theta. That's the law of cosines, right? A fundamental pro property of trigonometry. Well, if we just work these two equations out, so I'm gonna move this stuff over to the other side, I'm gonna divide by the two, right, or the negative two in this case, look at what I get. I get length of A plus length of B minus the squared length of A minus B over two. And if I simplify this equation, I get the dot product on the left side. What's on the right? 
the exact thing I said the dot product produced. So just using the law of cosines from your high school trigonometry class, you can see exactly what the law of uh, cosines says your dot product will give you. All right. So hopefully you believe me there, and I apologize for not proving the law of cosines to you, but at some point you got to stop. Math has axioms, and eventually you're going to hit a wall somewhere. I chose to stop it there. I would encourage anyone who really wants to drill all the way down, go look up the law of cosines. It's great extra reading uh, to accompany this lecture. All right. So why does this help us with our camera transform? Well, the reason this helps us with our camera transform is because if you look at what this equation does, a very special result will occur if we know one of our axes is unit length, okay? So what we know about world axes is usually we keep them unit length. If we wanna rotate something, all the axes stay length one, right? We don't scale, we don't stretch or shrink. Those axes, they all stay unit one. They started out, uh, you know, an x-axis, one, zero, zero, a y-axis, zero, one, zero, a z-axis, zero, zero, one, right? So we tend to know that our axes have a length of one. That means the dot product with one of the axes whose length is one, that length term disappears. We get just the length of the, the first input, right? Times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. And this is very powerful. Why is it powerful? Well, think of what happens when we actually construct the geometry of the situation. Here is our B with length one. This is an axis, right? This is gonna be one of our world axis, let's say. Then we have our vector, A. It's any length it wants to be. It's just an arbitrary point in the world or an arbitrary vector, whatever we want. Well, this forms a right triangle. Here is a right triangle right here. We can choose to drop the perpendicular down from this particular point that we've stretched out to along the vector A. We can drop that perpendicular down and what we know is that where we would land once we have a right triangle, we can basically compute anything we want just using our standard trigonometric functions, right? Because we know the ratio of this leg of a triangle to the hypotenuse is cosine theta. We know that the ratio of this leg of a triangle to the hypotenuse is sine theta, basic high school trig. So if we take the length of the hypotenuse, which is the uh, vector we're inputting, length of A, and multiply it by cosine theta, we would get how far along this axis we would be. And that's exactly what we want. It's a measurement of how, long, uh, how far along this axis I would travel to get to the point where I want to be for this coordinate in this axis, right? Remember stepping out along the axes? This is the reverse process. It's saying, let's say I was already here. How far would I step along B to get to the B if coordinate, right? If B was the X axis, the X coordinate of this input A. So that's how we get back to understanding the camera transform. A camera transform is a transform that measures points along axes. So we look instead at the rows of the matrix because those are the elements that will dot product the input. Again, let's do the measurement. Here is that same point, but we're doing the reverse process now. We have three axes we want to measure, right? the z prime, the x prime, the y prime. We want to measure along our camera axes. Where is this point? What would its coordinates be in this axis system? Right? <clears throat> and I guess I, <laughs> this is one of the things that you don't remember after giving a lecture for 10 years. I guess I didn't draw the measurements, but point being each of these dotted lines measures, right? how far I am along this axis and gives me those results. So that's how I do the analysis of the camera transform. Now, one of the things I'd like to point out is if you look at the two structures that I've just told you, you can see that they're very complementary. In the case where I want to talk about world positioning, I'm in columns. In the case that I want to talk about camera transforms, which is like undoing a world position, I'm in rows.
these are complementary. These are very complementary structures, right? In fact, they're the transpose. Remember I said what a transpose was? It's taking vectors that we're standing up and lying them down or vice versa. Well, if I was to transpose this whole matrix, right? If I was to transpose the whole matrix, I would do nothing but lie down my vertical X into XC, lie down my vertical Y into a horizontal YC, right? YW becomes YC. Lie down my vertical ZW into a ZC. Transposing a matrix just transpose each individual vector. Rows becomes columns, columns become rows, right? It just flips along the diagonal. So what you can see is actually, if I want to talk about changing a world placement, right? A camera transform uh, being RC, a world places being RW. If I want to change an RW into an RC or an RC into an RW, in very real terms, these are inverse operations. My RW, my world placement, takes an object and it puts it somewhere in the world. My RC, my camera transform, pretends I'm looking at the world from an object and takes the whole world and moves it back so that it aligns with the world axes. Those are inverse operations. We typically write the inverse of a matrix as the matrix negative one to the negative one power. That's inversion. Well, guess what? In this case, it's just a transpose. And this is why, if you've ever seen some, something say, for an orthogonal matrix, its inverse is its transpose. If you've ever seen that statement, this is why. Because if your matrices consist of nothing but unit axis system, then just transposing them produces the inverse operation. There's no mystery to it. We just did the whole thing. So. What I would like to point out is that if a matrix in the past has been more of a black box to you and you didn't understand how a rotation matrix works or you didn't understand why the inverse and the transpose were the same in the case of a rotation matrix, now you do. It wasn't so hard, right? It wasn't so hard to take the black box of a rotation matrix and get inside there and see what's really going on. Now we know. And there's so many things we can do now that we know. We can construct those matrices directly, right? Matrices directly. We can extract pieces fr from them trivially. We just know, oh, someone hands you a camera transform. I can just grab the top row out. Now I know exactly what the X axis is of the camera in world space, right? All of that understanding is now just all in our brains and accessible to us at any time in the pipeline. We can just go in there and, and know that all of this stuff is at our fingertips. Not to mention how much easier it is to debug these matrices once we know what they mean. All right, so that's one black box that we just opened, and now there's no mysteries there. There's no mysteries anymore. We get it, right? And that's a beautiful thing and a powerful thing. <clears throat> so now let's move on to the second black box. There's only two in this lecture. That was the first one. This is the second one. I told you we we're going to talk about normal mapping. Now we're going to talk about normal mapping. All right. <clears throat> so normal maps, like I said, there's a huge amount of information that you really need to understand if you wanted to write your entire own normal mapping system soup to nuts, right? But we're just going to focus on one part of it now, and that is how do we store them? Then how do we use them, right? So let's pretend we already have some way of getting these things. How do we store them? How do we use them? All right. Let's start with lighting. Because the only reason we care about normal maps in the first place is so that we can light our objects better. We wanna capture the lighting of lots of little bumps, little um, very sort of micro detail uh, along our surface. We want that lighting uh, information to be affected by our normal map. That's what we're trying to do just as, that's the entire point of having a normal map in the first place, right? And what you can see here is, a simple, uh, this is a simple illustration of how lighting works. In the real world, we have some uh, way that we're looking at a surface, right? And I've drawn a little eye here, and you can see that from the surface, we have a vector that points towards the eye. This is where the person is who's viewing it, right? It's where the camera is. And furthermore, what you can see is I've got a surface normal. That's a, a vector that points in the direction 
of the sort of tangent to the surface, right? So the surface is running along here and I've got a, a direction that points out, directly out of that surface at this one point. In order to understand the real lighting equation at this surface, what we must understand is that all of the light from everywhere is coming in and parts of it, depending on the exact structure of the surface, the material, everything like this, uh, even from behind the surface, in the case of subsurface scattering, things like this, all of the lighting is coming into a point and then a certain amount of it comes out at the point and that's what you see. And that's how real lighting works in the real world for the most part, is you have a bunch of photons, they come in, they hit a particular point and some of them scatter out. Your eye collects the ones that scattered out in the direction that comes towards your eye and that's what you see. Now there's a little more to it than that. Your eye is actually a lens so it collects actually a region of photons, it collects a, a conical region of photons, which is not the same thing as a single uh, line, but I can only cover so much in a lecture. All right, so <clears throat> how do we compute this kind of lighting? Well, a simple Lambertian material, as they're called, is one that assumes that a light that comes in, let's say from a point, uh, is radiated equally in all directions. So when it hits a surface, it's going to bounce back out. It's going to bounce back out at uh, the viewer the same, no matter where the viewer was, right? So it doesn't matter uh, where I'm looking, the surface always bounces the same amount of light out, right? But that's not entirely the whole story just because uh, of some elements of the uh, 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 of how things hit a surface that I'm going to cover in just one second. But the important part is, as I hit the surface, I'm going to bounce light out at the viewer, and I don't have any particular equations that talk about how this surface might want to prefer to bounce light in different directions. Lambertian materials are not common in the real world. Most real world materials have very uneven distributions of light. They will bounce light much more favorably in one direction than another. But again, that's a topic for a different lecture. We're not talking about lighting very much here, except as it applies uh, to normal mapping to kind of give you a little uh, bit of the flavor. So I'm not gonna go too much into that, right? Uh, but the point is if I were to look at the uh, material from up here or look at the material from over here, I'm not going to expect the material's properties itself to bias towards shining more brightly one uh, place than another, okay? That's about it. Uh, now, if the light moves, the same thing is true, right? So no matter where I put the light, I'm still shining out in the same uh, direction as well. However, all of that comes with one spe very specific caveat. And that caveat is that the light, when it bounces off a surface, more of the light is able to reflect out uh, in terms of how it hits the surface based on the angle. This is just a di uh, sort of a, how should I put this? This is a aspect simply of the differential geometry of the situation. So according to Lambert's cosine law, which is from 1760, so not exactly a recent development in the field of computer graphics, as you might imagine, it simply says that if I imagine a patch of the surface, no matter how big I choose to make it, it could be infinitesimally small or just an arbitrary size, what you can see is the shaft of light that would fall on that surface, right, from a light source. If the light source was the same size over here, right, or over here, I'm going to get a different size of the shaft of light depending on the angle. As it rotates down, that same thing that I showed you back for when we were talking about how to measure the edge of a triangle, that same thing is true right? The right triangle that I form right here is going to say that this right here by the law of cosines is only going to be proportional to the cosine of theta as wide as it would be if it was straight on, okay? And you can see I've kind of like uh, created that, that version of the diagram here and you can do it a couple of different ways, right? I put the triangle here, you could put it off to the side, however you want to put it, right? So anyway, we get back to the exact same thing that I showed before, right? This thing that we learned sort of as we went in and examined the dot product. This is actually already a piece of information you would encounter when you just start doing your lighting, right? So again, one of the things that 
I would emphasize is that understanding one black box typically applies to another black box because all of this stuff is interrelated and you see the same things coming up over and over and over again, right? Okay. So if we take a look at what's happening in this equation, we get the exact same thing that we got before. Um, and that is specifically, uh, we want to know, <clears throat> In this case, uh, we want to take the cosine of the angle between the two uh, vectors, right, which is this angle right here. Uh, we want to take the, the angle between the two vectors and we want to find uh, what their actual measure is going to be, right? Uh, and in order to do this, uh, I'll be honest, I don't like the way I've drawn this here at all. I'm not sure why I drew it that way. Maybe I wasn't thinking correctly when I actually drew it, but uh, let's pretend we just ignore this diagram here. <laughs> ignore this diagram, pretend it doesn't exist. Maybe I'll have to fix this diagram uh, for, for the video. But uh, what we want to do is we want to compute based on the law of, uh, uh, based, based on, again, that Lambert's cosine law, we want to compute how much light should be leaving the surface in a particular direction. That direction is based on the normal, right, times the, uh, based on the normal direction and the light direction. If we take those two directions and dot product them together, right, we will get that equation that we talked about when we were opening our first black box. Length of the first times length of the second times the cosine of the angle between them. Now, since we know that we could for free if we wanted to, or maybe not free, but we know we could condition these things properly so that the length of our uh, normal vector and the length of our light vector, we could make those be normal if we wanted to. We could normalize them, right, certainly. If that's the case, we could use the dot product to trivially compute the cosine of the angle between them. That's exactly what we need to compute Lambert's cosine law, which is a fundamental law of all light reflection, and we're gonna need it to produce our lighting equation, right? So, if we take a look at going back to the 1990s, right? Now we're going way back in history here. We're going back almost 30 years, right? If we go back to how hardware shading worked in the late 1990s, it looked like this, right? Uh, there was a vertex pipeline, uh, and that vertex pipeline could be parallelized. So we maybe had multiple vertex pipelines, it's hard to say, uh, depending on the circumstance. But basically what you did is you issued a bunch of uh, data to the vertex pipeline, and the vertex pipeline would transform your vertices for you, right? Some hardware could do this, some couldn't. Sometimes it's still done on the CPU. Out of that came a bunch of triangles, and those went to rasterizer engines. And how many of these, again, were dependent uh, on the card, but those would rasterize the triangles uh, into individual little pieces, right? And then each of those pieces would get handled by a pixel pipeline, which would figure out what color they should be, and then it would write them to the frame buffer. This is how it looked. Uh, now, if you looked at where this was divided, most of the time, uh, in the mid-90s to late 90s, the CPU typically did this part and the GPU typically did this part. Uh, this was because floating point math being very expensive just hadn't really gotten miniaturized yet to the point where it could be done in sufficient quantities uh, on, the, on the GPUs by the GPU manufacturers. It hadn't quite gotten to that stage yet. So they still were only doing uh, the pixel pipeline. It was usually done with fixed uh, iterators and stuff like this. So the floating point math just wasn't happening yet. And a vertex pipeline requires floating point math. It can't really be turned into fixed point very effectively. All right. So what this looked like was we specified triangles as a series of vertices, right? And here they are. Here's an example. Uh, those would get passed to a rasterizer, which produces a set of fragment values, right? Which is places where uh, on the pixel grid we need to process. And the pixel pipeline would go ahead and figure out what to do with them, right? So in here, we've got a smaller number of things, right? 0, 1, and 2. And that changes into a larger number of fragments, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever, right? OK. So uh, for a typical Guro shaded pipeline, what's Guro shading? You may not even know what it is anymore. It used to be a very common term. It's not so common anymore because nobody does it. Garo shading was one where basically, if you take a look at this, there was just a color at each of these points, right? So when you specify these vertices, you could specify a color, 
And then when you would interpolate the points, it would just figure out what the color of each of these was by figuring out where it was sort of barycentrically in this triangle. And it would av you know, sort of do a, like an average, a weighted average of how close it was to each of these points, right? Very simple interpolation of, to figure out what the color was, okay? Uh, so for a Gouraud shaded pipeline, again, we've got this information here uh, telling us how to get to a particular point like I showed you with the initial transform, right? Um, we've sort of got this <clears throat> idea uh, that if we had, for example, uh, coordinates of our triangle and we were using those coordinates to produce some kind of a world space movement, right? Uh, the same thing might be true of the colors inside a triangle. So we might have coefficients that are barycentric coefficients, meaning they're relative to the triangle. We might have the same exact thing. Again, this structure where I move along each one, the rasterizer might be doing this to compute the colors that it would then send to the pixel pipeline, okay? So what you can sort of see here is that amusingly enough, uh, you actually would end up getting into a situation where you'd use the exact same things you saw when we first opened uh, our black box, just our very simple black box of how matrix transform for rotation works. Both of the things that we talked about there, that construction of moving along a series of axes and the construction of dot product to two things together, those actually form the basis of how we would start to do uh, a Gouraud shading pipeline, how we would move from a Gouraud shaded pipeline where we're just interpolating colors into normal mapping. First, what we would do at the vertex stage is pass down some information about the normal uh, of the surface times the light, right? In the simple Gouraud shaded pipeline. Then the rasterizer uses the standard movement along the barycentric axes to produce interpolated colors, and then we output a pixel. This is a non-normal mapped pipeline, right? So if you imagine I want to produce these colors over here that are the lighting values of my surface, all I have is inputs here. What I would do in a very simple sense is just have normals at my vertices. I would do the dot product for each of those normals. The interpolation would take place in the rasterizer and the output, the pixel output, would just be the interpolated color and that's it, right? So that's a very simple, uh, it doesn't really do any normal mapping, right? Uh, but it does go ahead and produce uh, a, a, um, <clears throat> a lit surface that just only lights uh, as simple interpolations between the vertices. So the more dense your mesh, the more this would capture the lighting of the surface, but the sparser the mesh, uh, the less information there would be because the less times we would be doing those dot products between the normal and the lighting, right? Now there's an obvious problem with the Gouraud shading pipeline. Uh, and what you would see immediately if you start to look into this further is that if all we were doing, right, is interpolating the multiplication between these two, uh, then you get some pretty nasty results here, right? Uh, if all we do is interpolate the, the result of n times l, then if in the middle, right, if in this case, for example, uh, we have a situation where the light starts on this side and ends on this side. So we have L1 is out here and L0 is out here. So maybe we're taking two vertices of our triangle and one side of it has uh, one type, you know, the light relative to one vertex is pointing this direction, but then this vertex is on the other side of the light source, so it's over here. The interpolation between them is gonna pass through a place where it should have pointed directly at the light. We're never gonna capture that because the dot product of this and the dot product of this are basically going to be the same potentially. Um, and it's not gonna be able to capture that difference, right? Um, so we get into another problem here, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, uh, but we're gonna talk about that uh, a, a little bit later, right? Um, I don't, again, not sure exactly why I chose to do this, draw this here, uh, because it's not exactly what we mean. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, 10 years, 10 years, you'll forget some things about Electro, let's put it that way. Uh, so let's ignore that for now and I'll come back to it in a second. So the big thing that happened with normal mapping uh, and the thing to remember is that what we were able to start doing with normal mapping and the reason that it was gonna become such a particularly interesting thing is that once the hardware was able to move this equation, again, this is the normal dot producted with the light, which is just that thing that tells us what Lambertian's cosine was, right? Lambertian's cosine law. 
once that didn't happen ha have to happen at the vertex stage anymore, things started to get interesting. And the thing that made this possible was an innovation in hardware, and an innovation is probably the wrong term. It's just more of a getting more power, because you know you want to do this in hardware. The question is just how, right? How do you make the circuits for it? Uh, well, what they did is they introduced something in hardware called DOT3. And what DOT3 was was a blending mode which did the DOT product per pixel. So at every pixel on the screen, or per fragment, if you'd rather think of it that way, uh, fragments and pixels were basically the same at that point. Uh, but per, per fragment, what it could do is it could do this dot product at the fragment stage. What that meant was that now you no longer had to just take your lighting equations and compute them at the vertices. You could actually compute sort of part of the lighting equation down here per pixel. And that meant at every pixel you could track that light source. You didn't have to interpolate the results of the lighting. You could interpolate the lighting itself. And this was huge. Uh, the reason this was huge is because now, at a bare minimum, you could do Fong shading. Uh, Garo shading is one that just interpolates the result of the lighting across a triangle. Fong shading is one that at least captures the fact that a highlight could occur inside a triangle, right? And that's that thing I was trying to say before, where if you have this and the dot product is the same on either side, the dot product is going to change dramatically right here. But if those are your two vertices and all you have is those two points to interpolate between, you're never going to catch that, that highlight. But now, you could, if you wanted to, right? Because instead, what I could do is tell the rasterizer to interpolate both the normal and the light, and then the pixel shading pipeline will dot product them together, okay? All right, so now what we can do is we can do Lambert's cosine law every pixel, and this allows some tremendous freedom, right, in terms of computing our lighting. So now what we can do, instead of accidentally producing the exact same cosine the entire way across, because we're just interpolating this one value that's already been here, right? What we can do is start to look at it as actually producing a new cosine value, right? That will give us more light reflected when we actually hit that middle point, even if it's inside a triangle. And this is crucial. Okay. So... <clears throat> a Fong shading pipeline doesn't actually require any normal maps. It just requires you letting the rasterizer interpolate the normal and the light source, like so. Again, this is being interpolated in a barycentric fashion, uh, which we didn't really cover in too much detail in this lecture, but it's exactly the same thing uh, that I showed you originally uh, when we were talking about that sort of combination of axes uh, to produce a point. We're just doing that. And it allows us to interpolate values over a triangle so that we know what the values of that uh, are at any point in the triangle. All right. So the last piece of the equation that we're missing is this term down here, which is the normalization term. The reason we have a normalization term is because if you take a look at how these work, these don't uh, give us normals back necessarily, okay? Uh, and that's a, a problem because we know that we said we wanted the, the light source and the normal to be unit length vectors so that our cosine, uh, so that we could use the dot product to compute the cosine and the angle between them. If they're not unit length, then that equation breaks down because remember it's length of A, length of B, cosine theta. If we need length of A and length of B to be one so that we just get cosine theta out, well, we don't really have the option of doing that anymore. So the problem is we need an extra term in here. We need a term that corrects our dot product to produce a, a more normalized result. And so what we can do here um, <clears throat> in the case of, of a pixel shader is what we can do is we can actually normalize the light source right in the pixel shader if we want to. Right? And that, that solves that problem for us. But what do we do about the normal to the surface? Well, we could normalize that as well. So if we wanted to do a Fong shading pipeline, we could choose to normalize both of them, right? We could normalize the normal and normalize the light source, and that would be fine. But if we want to move to a normal map pipeline, well, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Why? Because the normal is going to come from a texture anyway, right? So this is where we finally get the normal mapping pipeline that we sort of stumbled upon once dot three texture mapping was available. And that is that if we interpolate with a light direction across a triangle, then we can also just read the normal from a texture. 
because since we can read things from textures, we might as well read the normal out. That would allow us to vary the normal across the surface as if it had a lot more detail than the mesh would imply. So that's what this looks like. We have a vertex. At the vertex, we specify where the light is. That gets interpolated across our triangles, which are built up of vertices. We normalize it at every pixel because you know, it's gonna become non-normal as it interpolates. But then we just read the texture uh, to find out what our normal is. All right. Uh, so that's really all we need to know in terms of how shading works. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of background about how a normal map actually gets applied at the shading stage. We take the normals out of textures, we specify the lights at vertices, and then we dot product those two things together, uh, the light getting interpolated across the pixels to produce Lambert's cosine law. Now, obviously, if you wanted to do better lighting, you could use that information to produce more than just Lambert's cosine law. You could look up into tables, you could use cube maps, you could do all sorts of things to produce fancier lighting uh, that has more real surface properties. But again, that part doesn't really matter. I'm just showing the simplest possible normal mapping pipeline, but the lighting equation can be extended in, in all sorts of ways. So how do we encode normal maps, right? How are we gonna encode these normal maps? Uh, well, as you might imagine, the simplest way to think about this is just to think about in the world, right? Uh, there is a triangle that I'm trying to encode, and it presumably has a lot more information along its surface than I'm actually gonna encode at the vertices. If I was to only record normals at each of these vertices, then inside here, any perturbation of the surface is no longer recorded, it's just flat. So the goal of the normal map is to say, let's take a texture map and let's place this triangle somewhere in the texture map, however we want to map it. Again, that's a topic for a whole nother black box. But let's place it somewhere. And then inside there, let's use all of the texels, all of the information in this texture to encode what the normal is. So what we want to encode here is we want to encode that at a certain UV in this texture map, we have a certain normal that corresponds to some point on our mesh, okay? So again, looking back here at what we've got, we're just interpolating the normal um, in a way that's going to read it from a texture and they're gonna be, here's the texel zero, texture one, and so, uh, and so forth. It's gonna read from those points uh, in the texture map and interpolate between those. So what we will pass down is just UV coordinates that say where in the texture to look, those will get interpolated here and pulled out as a texel, which represents our normal, right? Okay, so now let's put this all together. Imagine we have a surface, here's like one, I'm gonna look at just a slice of it. Here's one vertex and here is the direction of the light source, you know, if we imagine the vertex is here. Here's the direction of the light source if we imagine the vertex is here, right? And of course, we're gonna shade this whole surface. So along here, the light is just gonna point up towards the light the whole way, right? As we interpolate between these two vectors. Um, what you can see here, if you imagine what's going on here, uh, is that the input to our vertex, again, is very simple. It's just the light in world space minus wherever the point is, right? So you can see here, P0 is at this location. If I want to know what the lighting vector is I should pass, well, it's very simple. It's just wherever the light is minus wherever the point is. So our input to the vertex stage is very straightforward. The rasterizer stage, we know we're passing a texture here. That's very straightforward. We know it's gonna interpolate the lights we pass here, so we don't have to do anything else. And the pixel stage is rote. It's just that dot product, right? And then we have to normalize the light. So it's very simple to pass the light direction in, okay? Uh, and you can see here, if I were to rotate the surface, okay, it's pretty straightforward what happens to all of my values. If I was to change the orientation of my surface, I could multiply each point by a rotation matrix, just like we showed at the beginning. I could multiply the normal by that rotation, and I would rotate everything uh, in the surface, okay? So producing new lighting points is very straightforward. But let's look at this. If we have a texture map, okay, that encodes our normals, what are we gonna do here? 
because this vector is a problem for us. We can't go rotate every value in the um, texture map, right? Because it's a statically stored texture map that's just sitting on the GPU. We made it and now it's on there. We don't want to run through every frame and rotate each of those normals to properly point uh, in the direction they're pointing now that the object has rotated. So when we want to move an object around, we got a problem, right? However, we can solve this problem really easily. If we know we can't change the texture, what if we just change the light to pretend that the light is the thing that moved and not the texture, right? Because remember, as Einstein would tell us, I don't know if he would really tell us this, but everything's relative. Instead of rotating my object, couldn't I just rotate the light in the opposite way? For example, if I was to look at this diagram and say, well, I'm not going to rotate this object like this. Instead, I'm just going to rotate the light over here, right? And leave this the same. I could do that, couldn't I? Right? I could do that. So if we look at what happens, instead of trying to bend the normal or something like this uh, to accommodate the direction the light should be going, instead what I can do is I can just imagine that if my normal has to still point in the same direction it used to point, well, let's just move the whole world so that the light is just where it should be. And that's exactly what I can do. If we take our equation over here, right, and we say, I want to do the inverse operation on the light location, where the light would be if I had rotated my point by this matrix, right? So I'm applying this rotation. If we just work the math out, we get R inverse times the light minus just the original input point, and that's because R inverse in itself will cancel, right? The inverse transform times the transform is just gonna be nothing. And I've already determined, because thanks to opening that black box at the beginning, we know the inverse of just a rotation matrix is its transpose. We know that if I just transpose this matrix times the light, I will get the operation I'm talking about, right? So if I just perform this operation first and then subtract the uh, point away, I will get the equation in that original space, right? In that sort of transformed space, even though I'm no longer multiplying pH times that. So now I just have a way of producing this information. My LH becomes my newly oriented light source and I just subtract my pH from that, right? So again, this is a really interesting thing if you think about it. By understanding all of the stuff we understand about matrices now, we can trivially solve this actually relatively problematic situation we would have encountered by just going, hey, I know I don't have to always transform my objects. I could just inverse transform the light and that's the same as transforming my object. Off we go. And it's trivial to compute that. It's just a transpose. I don't even have to do any computation. It's just flipping some numbers around, right? So again, we get back to understanding these matrices leads to all sorts of other understanding that we can apply. And this is where we get to understanding object space normal mapping, which is what I've just described. It's normal mapping where you take a light source, you map it into the space of an object, and then you read out of a normal map the direction the normals are going, and you multiply them together. All right? So that's a pretty easy way to understand basically everything that's involved in object space normal mapping. Now let's go to something a little bit more complicated. If we have deformable surfaces, right, which are characters, stuff like this, uh, which you might want to use normal mapping on. Object space normal mapping, if you just have, a, say, a crate lying around in the world, well, you're done, right? Object space normal mapping takes care of it. Transform the light into the space of the object by using the inverse of the object's uh, transform. Encode the normals in the normal map as just normals in world space or I should say object space in this case, right? Whatever the object's rest orientation is. Execute the pipeline as written and you're done. Dot three takes care of the rest. However, let's suppose we have a character. Its surfaces are deforming. What do we do now? Now we've got problems because deformable surfaces cannot encode normals and have the light bend to meet them anymore 
because the whole surface itself is deforming, which means that any individual piece of the surface now has a different opinion of where the light was if the normals can't bend, right? This seems to be a pretty tricky problem, right? So if I imagine a deformable surface, let's say, you know, part of a character's arm as the elbow is bending. Well, if it's highly bent, then we get a surface like this, and this is how the normals are supposed to read. If it's not bent much at all, that same surface may have normals that look more like this. This becomes a problem for us. Even though these are the same normals encoded in the texture map, potentially, we need to know that their orientation in world space bend, you know, is having this bend applied to it. So what are we going to do, right? How are we going to solve this problem? And you can see here, if I've, I've shown you the normals at the vertices here, uh, the normals at the vertices change, right, as we bend. All right, so the key here is to go, how do we find a way to encode uh, the normal maps in such a way that we could still use them even if the surface is bending? And it seems a little bit like an intractable problem at first, but if you dig a little bit deeper, you realize actually we can probably do the same thing we did for objects that don't deform just by treating the transforms more locally. Instead of having an object space transform, what if we just thought about transforms that existed at the vertices? Because that's what's deforming. All right. So how do I encode this normal? How do I encode that normal right there? Well, what if I had a frame of reference at each vertex and I encoded the normal relative to the interpolated frame of reference that's in between those two vertices, right? So I have a frame of reference at P0, I have a frame of reference at P1, and then I know by interpolating those two frames of reference, a one a frame of reference specifically for that very point on the object. And I encode the normal just like I use the object space, just, the, just a resting object's frame of reference to encode the normal in the object space sense, I'm going to use this specific interpolated frame of reference to encode the normal here. That's what I write into the texture. I write into the texture whatever the values of the normal would be in this interpolated frame of reference, right? Well, if I did that, then what I could do is say, all right, at every vertex, I'll transform the light into the vertices frames of reference. And then I will know where the light is in an interpolated frame of reference so that the normal can still be in its own space unmolested. And it can know where the light would be relative to its frame of reference, right? So the light here, LF, is where the light is in this frame of reference interpolated so that the normal would not have to bend. It's a little bit mind boggling, right? And I've hand waved everything. How do we build vertex frames of reference, right? How do we even know what that means? Well, the answer is we have to develop something that is a rigorous way of defining at any given point on our mesh, some kind of a space we can map things into that will interpolate properly across the surface of the object. And that's exactly what we did back in the days when normal mapping had to be sort of created. Right? What we did is create something called a tangent space. And what a tangent space is, is it's a full three-dimensional axis system interpolated over the whole object that encodes the tangents to the surface, the normal and a full frame of reference around the normal. Now we know one part of it. We're going into it pretty uh, well equipped on one axis. And that axis is the z-axis, right? We know the normal is pointing in a particular direction which we've been told every vertex has a normal when the mesh was made, we know that one. So the question are, is, what are the other two axes? So if we look at what we have to do, we know what we have to do is take the light in world space, we need to subtract the point that we're given, whichever point it is, right? That'll give us that vector. And then we need to map that 
into a local tangent space. And to map it into a local tangent space, we need some kind of a transform. And we'll use the inverse transform, right, of whatever this vertex space is. We know one component is a normal. We don't know what the other two components are. All right. So what we are looking for, if we were to take a diagram, is that at a particular vertex of our mesh, we want to produce a vector A and a vector B such that they form a nice little orthogonal, uh, well, it's not really necessarily orthogonal, I shouldn't quite say that yet, but a nice little tangent space basis here that we can use for mapping our light source in so that when we want to work with our normals, we'll always be in the space the normals were encoded, even if our surface is deforming. How are we gonna do it? Right? How are we gonna start from this and get there? Well, <clears throat> it turns out we have more information than we think. We don't just have the normals. We know that the normal map itself has to be applied to this mesh. And in order for the normal map to be applied to the mesh, we also know that the U coordinate and the V coordinate of the texture map has to be applied at all the vertices. So we actually know what the frame of reference is in the texture, right? Because we know the U and V coordinates. So we have another piece of information we can use to form a basis that aligns with the way that the surface has been mapped by the artist, textured over it, right? So what we can use is we can use the direction that those U coordinates and V coordinates are going in order to produce a tangent space for our mesh. Now you see I've notated it here with something that's gonna be very unfamiliar with you and bit outside the scope of this uh, lecture uh, to cover the general version of it. Uh, and that is the gradient, right? This is the gradient operator. And what the gradient operator says is it says the direction of change, basically, right? The direction that you're going. Um, and there's a lot of ways that you can use this. Uh, it comes up very often. It's a very, very important operation. Uh, to understand, we're only going to focus on one particular application of it in this lecture. And again, it would make for great additional reading if you want to go find out more about it. But for right now, we're only going to talk about one aspect of it. And the aspect of it that we're going to talk about is very specifically figuring out what direction U and V go so that we can align our coordinate frame with how the texture moves across the surface, which will produce us a nice, solid basis for interpolating our normal. Okay. <clears throat> so, even without knowing what this operator is, and let's just pretend we don't even know there is such an operator. Let's pretend we don't even know enough math to know that a gradient is a thing. We have no idea. We don't know what that is, and we don't care. We just know what we want it to mean. What we want it to mean is that I say grad U, or whatever I'm saying here, this symbol U, means the direction in which U is changing, right? Or grad V is the direction in which V is changing, right? Uh, more specifically, let's say I imagined I'm standing on the surface of my mesh, and I'm going to increase just the V value. I'm not going to touch U at all. What direction do I walk along that to keep U constant, but V changing? Or vice versa, I'm gonna change U, right? Where do I move across the surface to change U and only U and V stays the same? So you don't need to know what a gradient is and you don't need to care, actually, right? In order to look at this particular circumstance here, um, all you need to know is that I'm going to define that operator that way. Let's not even use the term gradient. We'll just say we're going to use this operation here to mean I want the place where only this thing changes and the other thing doesn't change. Okay. So if I take a look at this equation, what I have written out is a statement of exactly what I just said for you. I am going to say that A, some scalar, times the first UV, right, whatever it is in the, in, I'm, I'm imagining 0, 1, 0, uh, 
<clears throat> I should define these terms a little more carefully here. So, because I drew the diagram and haven't said much about it. I have P0, right? And then I have P1 out here and P2 out here, right? I have this. If I take the vector from P to P2 or from P to P1, if I take those vectors, so I would subtract P2 from P1 for this vector, I subtract P1 from P for this vector, I would get a change in UV if I subtracted the U coordinates. I would get a change in XYZ if I subtracted the X coordinates, right? So if I subtract the UV value at P2 from the UV value at P1, I get the change in U as I go from, from uh, P0 to P1. The same is true of two. So I have two basis vectors, if you will, going from zero to one and zero to two. And I can look at the change in UV coordinate and I can make a vector. So this is in UV space, right? It's on the texture map, you can think of it that way. So if I write this equation, some scalar times U, uh, the, the UV change from zero to one, plus some scalar times the change in, uh, in U from zero to two, change in UV from zero to two. That left-hand side represents an arbitrary combination of these two vectors, right? So I can take an arbitrary combination, any scalar I want, any scalar I want, of these two deltas, if you will, and I can say I want that arbitrary combination to come out to be equal to a unit change in U and no change in V. That's exactly the thing I said I wanted, the direction in which U is changing and where V does not change at all, okay? Now, why do I want that? What does that do for me? Well, once I know the A and B that produce this result, I can use the same A and B to produce a combination of the X, Y, Z deltas to get me my gradient U direction, right? Because the combination of these two vectors that produces a unit walk in U, I can just look at the X, Y, Z and go, that's the direction in world space where that would occur as well. So now I'm left with a simple task of solving what is a two-dimensional equation, two unknowns, two equations. Here's the scalar, right? All I'm doing is multiplying a u0 plus b u0, uh, a u0 1 plus b u0 2 equals 1, a v0 1 plus b v0 2 equals 0, right? Here it is. I have two equations in two unknowns. That's high school algebra. Everyone can do it. Here it goes. Right? There's my solution for A, solving for A, plugging back into the other equation, solving for B, here's my B, plug back in to solve for A, and here we go. I won't belabor the steps because again, this is high school algebra. Everyone's had to do this at some point if they ever went to high school, right? That's it. So now I know just from high school algebra, I know that these two equations are how I produce the A and B values that would tell me gradient U. Done deal. I can repeat that process for V, right? Same exact thing. Now I just have a C and a D, and instead of solving for one zero, I solve for zero one. Off we go. Look familiar? It should, it's exactly the same, right? The only difference is the terms are swapped. Because if you start with zero, one, you get different multiply through as one, zero. But it's exactly the same process and produces nearly exactly the same results, right? So now all we need to do is apply these, right? We just need to apply these through. Uh, and as we go, I don't know why I wanted to call that out specifically. I think I just wanted to say that you'll note that this is on the denominator of all of them, right? Uh, oh, well, you know what? I may have mentioned in the original lecture that that ha was the determinant of uh, two by two matrix, but uh, you know what? That's too much. 
We've already covered too much math. I'll simply say if you want to read about determinants, this might be a motivation for you to do so. Again, additional reading related to uh, this particular topic. All right, so that's how we could produce a tangent space very easily. By doing those two equations, we'll get a u and a v, which we combine with our n to give us an idea of how the surface is changing in that area that will be stable as long as the uv map is stable, which we know it has to be because the artist had to make a continuous uv map along those triangles in order to not have seams in the texture anyway, right? Uh, so here's, uh, I believe this again was just the determinant part. This is the determinant of the matrix. So again, I'm going to leave that for additional reading. So with this, we can build our tangent frame. Here is what it would look like, right? Uh, delta U, delta V, I'm sorry, uh, gradient U, gradient V, and then the N, right? The normal that we already had. Now, oftentimes this space is normalized, uh, I'm sorry, orthogonalized. So these things will not all necessarily be orthogonal to each other. They won't produce a standard unit frame uh, where everything's at right angles to each other. So sometimes people normalize these, sometimes they don't. There's reasons to and not to, again, not really relevant to the lecture at this point, but point being, this is where you start. And you can choose to normalize this or choose not to normalize, depending on what you're trying to do, right? But here's our tangent frame. We've got it. Again, simple math, high school algebra, we can do it. All right, so now we know how to encode. We produce those tangent frames at each vertex. We interpolate the tangent frame to the point we're trying to encode, right? Again, just by doing that standard uh, uh, bare center composite. And then we map the normal into that tangent frame and store it in the normal map. Very, very straightforward. And so now we have to come back here and look at what we're doing. This was our pixel pipeline, right? And the only change we have to make, because remember, this has to stay the same because the hardware can't do anything else. This is all it could do at that time. We didn't have programmable pixel shaders, really. We just had, I mean, there was they were slightly, they were more like crossbar, so you could sort of just route things a little bit. So this is all we could really do. There wasn't much we could do. And by the way, even this we couldn't really do. You had to look it up in a cube map. That's a whole other story. But basically, this is all we could do in the picture. They weren't uh, programmable shaders like they are today where they have lots of flexibility. So the only thing we can really modify is out here. Good thing we can, right? So all we have to do is we just take that light and instead of doing the inverse transform by a stationary object transform that we were using before, now we just do the tangent frame. That's the only modification we have to do. Now it costs more on this side. Why? Because we have to produce those interpolated tangent frames. Uh, interpolated not along the triangle because again, we're we're not really going to interpolate the tangent frames along the triangle. We're going to interpolate the transformed light. But as we deform our surfaces, we have to deform our tangent spaces with them. So there was more work to be done here during deformation. But other than that, this was all we had to do. Right? So that's tangent space normal mapping, soup to nuts. Here's what one looks like. Uh, this is a tangent space normal map of the head that I showed at the beginning, the half head, right? And what you can see is when you encode a normal map in here, you get kind of exactly what you would expect. All of the information that is that you see as lighting in here is encoded as sort of uh, three-dimensional offsets. And the, tr uh, the convention when encoding a normal map is that you encode a normal map as X, Y, Z, R, G, B, right? The x goes into the uh, the x coordinate. The x goes into the r. The y goes into the g. Uh, the z goes into the b. Now, as we got further along and shaders got more able to do more work, uh, it became unnecessary to store all three because you could actually just store two and generate the third. Because since it's a normal, once you get two values, you can generate the third. Right? It's pretty cheap to do that. Uh, but you know, originally we didn't have the option, so you actually had to store all three. And so if you take a look at what this looks like, you can see it's overwhelmingly blue because most of the time the surface doesn't deviate much from just the normal, normal direction. It's a slight deviation. You can see red where it starts to point um, in, in some direction x-wise, right? You can see green uh, in one where it starts to deviate y-wise, right? So you can sort of read these. You can see it's a very logical thing uh, as it was placed on the surface, okay? So that's how normal maps, how uh, it was determined at the time. But again, nobody knew how to do any of this stuff. 
People had to work out every last little detail, right? Everything from how you figure out what tangent spaces are to even that you wanted to do that, uh, to how you did the dot three, how, I mean, the hardware people had to figure out the dot three was even useful, right? And put it in the hardware and you had to figure out how you were gonna use it and all these sorts of things, right? All of this was unknown. And now today it's all known, okay? Um, so what I wanna really emphasize here, if you take a look at all that stuff, uh, you can see how every little single black box, every little piece that you choose to look into repeats itself and affects everything, right? A very simple uh, sort of uh, analysis of very simple matrix math at the beginning, it repeated again and again and again and again and again inside that normal mapping stuff. And even if you didn't understand anything that I just said, Hopefully you could see that repetition and those echoes all throughout there, right? Because pushing forward on one thing and learning how that thing works, there is almost never a time in game engine development where everything that you learn and all of those aspects that come uh, together to teach you how something worked don't come back again and again and again. And if you've done enough of these, you will have a toolbox capable of pushing beyond where we even are today, right? And that's exactly what happened back in those days. There was no normal mapping. People who understood how these things worked and pushed forward and did experiments and applied the knowledge they'd learned by digging into things people had already figured out created a whole new technology which today we take for granted. That is not the last time that will happen. It will happen many, many, many more times before game development is really understood. We are probably still at the infancy of what a game engine can do. And the game engines that you can license today or use are a far cry from taking advantage of all of what the knowledge of math and the world and physics and everything have to offer us, but we just don't know what it is because we haven't pushed out there yet. Not to mention a bunch of the new fields, deep reinforcement learning, these sorts of things coming to fruition now in terms of AI or other stuff. What did those have in them? Go take a look. Tons of matrices, dot products, thresholding, gradients, all of these things, they come up everywhere. So what I really want you to take away from this lecture is not any of the specifics. I don't care if you know anything about matrices or normal mapping after having heard that. What I care about is you understanding how all of this is interrelated and how always, no matter where you are, game development is so early right now that there are so many black boxes out there to open, ones we don't even know exist yet that you could find. And when you open one, you see a ton more, right? And we don't understand any of these yet. And when you open one of those, you get a ton more, and we don't know how to do any of these right yet. And when you open one of those, you'll get even more. And every single one of those will teach you something. And furthermore, will lead to questions about whether we even know how to do that right yet, or could it be better? Could it be faster? Could it be higher quality, right? Could there be more to do there that would lead to more features, more flexibility, things we didn't even know we could do yet, or that we didn't know we could do with this, right? And the answer is almost always that there is. So this is really, to a large extent, probably that is what game development looks like right now. And if the general attitude, unfortunately, goes from the kind that it was in the 1990s, which is every single game developer was pretty highly skilled in black box stuff, if it goes to something where game developers don't do that anymore and you just take what you are given and assume that's the end of the universe that can be explored, this is where we'll end up. 
And I don't really think that's a good place to end up. I think we've only scratched the surface in what games can do on any front. Whether it's things like visual quality that we've pushed pretty far on, there's plenty further we can go. But more importantly on things like artificial intelligence, right? How stories work in games. How a game network does networking. All of these things are incredibly hard technical problems that we've only scratched the surface of. And I'd rather see us keep pushing forwards. I want to see it look like this before I'm dead. And I want to feel like when I die, people are still looking to make it look like that. And that someday way in the future, we'll get all the way out there, right? Because black boxes are just things that are waiting to be improvements, right? And so anytime we look at something and say, I just use this and I don't know how it works, it's kind of like accepting a limitation that we shouldn't accept uh, and accepting a small defeat instead of pushing for a victory. So that's what I wanted to get across with this lecture. And I hope that I've done a little bit of sort of a opening of one of these or two of these in this case black boxes for you so you can kind of see how that goes. It only gets better from there. Those are simple black boxes and pushing through a really hard black box is probably one of the greatest uh, feelings you can have in development where you open something up and you really figure out how it works and you push the tech forwards. Uh, there's really nothing else like it. So if you're the kind of person who thinks that sort of thing would be uh, exciting or interesting and you like knowing how things work you don't like accepting just use something someone else made or just this is how it goes you don't need to look into it if you don't like accepting those answers you're the kind of person who this sort of programming is for and I highly recommend you look into it there'll always be a job for you if you're good at this sort of thing because so few people have the fortitude to do it and spend the time to get good at it uh, so that's my lecture how to open a black box I hope you enjoyed it uh, and if you're interested in this sort of thing, uh, please look into being a serious game engine programmer. Uh, it's a great place to encounter a lot of really challenging problems. And uh, with that, I will uh, take some questions.